Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Maria Pio, and I am co-director at the Godwin Turnbeck Museum at Queens College, where I oversee administration and education programs. Tonight, we are happy to be part of Kufferberg Center for the Arts online program, the latest installment in a series of conversations with artists, musicians, writers, and curators. We hope you've been enjoying some of GTM and KCA's virtual offerings over the past several months. If you have not had a chance after the program, I invite you to view the museum's virtual exhibitions and programs on our website at gtmuseum.org. And check out kufferbergcenter.org for a complete listing of upcoming programs through Kufferberg Center for the Arts. I want to take a moment to thank our donors and funders of both GTM and KCA, including Queens College, Friends of the Godwin Turnback Museum, the Avery Arts Foundation, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the Museum Association of New York, New York Community Bank, the De New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the Max and Selma Kufferberg Family Foundation, and of course, all of you. Without your support, we would not be able to bring this type of programming to you all today. This evening, it is my pleasure to introduce to you artist and photographer Orestes Gonzalez, whose photographs from the Disruption series are part of the museum's current exhibition, Migrations, A Study of Arts and Identity. We invite you to join in the conversation throughout the program with your comments and questions for Orestes in the chat section here on YouTube. We will have time after the talk to go through some of these questions. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Orestes Gonzalez. Hi, Maria, how are you? Good Hi, evening. Orestes, welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm very honored to participate in this program. Thank you so much. Orestes, the photographs that are part of the current exhibition at GTM are so powerful. Thank Where you. did you get the inspiration for this series? Um, actually, the, the, uh, this series started as a curatorial effort that I put together about four years ago uh, with some other artists photo artist and uh, we exhibited at the uh, Center for Photography at Woodstock. Um, and um, once we put it up, I, I kind of fell in love with the series because it's based on uh, conversations I've had with people, uh, stories that, I, that I've found in the news um, and uh, personal, conversations and dialogues I've had with acquaintances that uh, I have met casually through my travels. Um, uh, so I started putting these stories together um, in text form and then adding images to, to go with these stories. And uh, some of them are documentarian in nature, some are, some are more symbolic. Uh, but they all make sense because they all touch subjects that are part of the world uh, scene right now. You know, war, famine, um, global warming, migrations because of economic or political reasons. Um, things that are important to us to acknowledge and to make sure that we know that are there in the forefront. And uh, it's called disruption because uh, most of these people experienced things that were beyond their control and in turn disrupted their lives uh, in, in a way that they weren't planning for something to happen. Um, I think I think we it would be a great idea to start putting some of some of the illustrations on on the screen. For example, one of the one of the uh, images in the show is this one, which uh, I recorded in on on the beach in Sicily. Um, this gentleman I, I saw uh, walking his his wares down the beach for like hours upon hours every day, and uh, I finally talked to him about where he was from, and he's a he's a guy from Ethiopia. He's been doing this for five years. Um, working 12 hours a day, 
uh, selling inflatables, inflatables on the beach and basically supporting his wife and two children that live in, in Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, that really struck me, you know, how somebody like that can be away from their family and not see his children grow up. And the only way he could survive is to be in a different country and uh, support them financially that way. Um, and other other things like uh, other so uh, topics like uh, global warming. Uh, for example, this is a photograph I took in in, in Iceland in Reykjavik, uh, but it relates to a conversation I had with. Uh, some friends uh, regarding their grandparents who live in in the northern part of uh, Reykjavik, and uh, it's a story of these two, this this old couple, this older couple who heard a crack in the foundation of their basement. They they went downstairs, and uh, they discovered this green ooze coming out of the crack. Um, much much to their surprise, uh, their house started sinking. Um, and it's because uh, they had built their house, like everybody else there, um, on the permafrost. And the perm permafrost is with uh, withdrawing and, and it's melting. And uh, in four days, they lost their house. Um, so um, I wanted to, I wanted to show the the importance of what what we're doing to to our planet by the global warming that we're experiencing right now. Um, in another in another story, which I think is pretty pretty interesting, I was talking to my partner, who's a high school teacher and and a friend, and they were they were talking to me about. Uh, these two girls that had won first place in, in a science project um, and they were going to be sent to to a competition, a national competition in Texas. They were all ready to go. But uh, at the last moment, they decided not to send them because the two girls were undocumented. And because of the current political atmosphere that we that we were experiencing three, four years ago, uh, they decided not to send them. So a less qualified um, pair of students went in, instead, and these two girls weren't able to receive the, uh, the, the attention they deserve because of their status here in the United States. So that touches off, obviously on immigration and the status of undocumented citizens and the status of some of those citizens who have children here that grew up here and um, are still undocumented legally. Um, another pretty interesting story is a story of, of Dewey. Uh, Dewey is a hairdresser. Um, she um, was originally from Indonesia and was originally named Hassan. She transitioned about seven years ago after immigrating from Jakarta uh, to Los Angeles and eventually wind, winding up uh, moving to New York. When she left uh, Jakarta, uh, her Muslim father disowned her and told her not to ever come back. But true to, to love and, and true to form, um, Dewey works as a hairstylist in in Brooklyn and very religiously sends her father $100 every month to support him. So this is these are these are people that you know are working in very humane conditions that that in in very quiet situations that show you the strength of the individual and their dedication to their family. Um, I'm from Cuba. Um, I, I was raised in this country, but um, my my heritage is from Cuba. When I went to Cuba in 2016, um, I went to the to the flower market where 
I met this uh, this woman. Her name is Lady. She had uh, been working at the flower market for for over five years, um, and every penny she collected, she she collected. Uh, her plan was to leave Cuba and eventually move to the United States. So uh, a year later, I heard that uh, she had moved from Cuba and was living in Panama. But unfortunately, the two days after she got to Panama, um, the uh, the Obama administration changed the wet foot, dry foot status um, of Cuban immigrants arriving in the States. So therefore, her entry into the United States was negated. Um, she uh, was stuck in the border in Mexico where she has no status. And uh, we don't know what happened to her. I know that she never was able to to come back into the United States, and she was stuck in she was stuck in Mexico um, with no status whatsoever in Mexico or in the United States, and uh, probably not be able to go back to Cuba. I also, besides global warming, I I also like to touch on um, the environment. Um, this is a story I heard about these two little girls in Italy um, who um, who uh, spend their days at the beach in Catania. And um, she, uh, both of them have, have relatives that have, have gotten very sick because of environmental concerns in, in, in this part of Sicily. Her, uh, her, their names are Gia and Annalisa, and Annalisa's grandmother died of thyroid cancer when she was 58. Um, and Gia's mom, who's in her late 30s, suffers from an extreme case of bronchitis where she's uh, bedridden for, for most of the day. Um, thyroid cancer in in this part of Sicily is is significantly significantly higher than anywhere else on on the island, and most official uh, official information that comes out of the reasons are that they're very close to Mount Etna, which is thirty miles away, but there are activists that are saying it's it's other environmental reasons why this is happening. Um, they haven't been able to to prove either yay or nay, or that it's basically from the uh, power plants that have been installed uh, in this part of Italy for, for the longest time. And uh, this is Arjun. This is a, a, a really personal story. I was driving through the coast of uh, Washington state, basically towards Bremerton, where there's a huge uh, harbor uh, containing these uh, decommissioned ships that uh, the, the Navy de decommissions and starts dismantling um, in, this, in this part of the state. And as I drove into the parking lot of uh, of this this area, um, I noticed an, a Pakistani family taking pictures of the little boy in front of the sh one of the ships, and um, I started talking to them, and they explained to me that the little boy's name is Arjun. He's uh, six years old, and he wanted to have his picture taken in front of a ship like the one his daddy used to be in, and. Uh, I talked to his mom, and she said that his dad had just uh, been killed in in Iraq uh, on one of these ships. So he, he wanted to he wanted to mem memorialize his uh, his daddy by having a, his picture yeah. taken in front of one of these ships. Mm -hmm. 
this guy is uh, his name is Mario Fulvio. I took this photograph in La, La Boca section of Buenos Aires. Uh, this is a very touristy area where people come and have their pictures taken in this very quaint, colonial, very colorful part of Buenos Aires next to the to the industrial harbor. Um, people uh, have their pictures taken uh, with these. Uh, these uh, openings where you could stick your face in so you could have your picture taken as a, as tango dancers. And I was talking to him and he wasn't from uh, Argentina. He was actually from Paraguay. And uh, he left Paraguay when he was 12 years old. He had no family. So he hitchhiked his way down from Paraguay to, to Argentina and wound up in, uh, in Buenos Aires. And he's been there all, all this time. He uh, doesn't have formal status. He has not applied for it. Um, he lives day to day. He lives on whatever he can collect by the end of the day. And he's been living this way for the past 12 years, which really struck me because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an existence of subsistence. And um, it's, it, it kind of shows you um, how people are living, how people are living not only in here, but in, in many parts of the world where there's no security and uh, you live on a day-to-day -day subsistence. Um, and talking about day-to-day, -day, um, whenever I would go to the Home Depot here in, in, uh, in New York, I see a bunch of guys uh, sitting in the in the parking lot waiting to, to for somebody to to uh, hire them for the day, and this particular gentleman, uh, what kind of struck me as somebody that I'd like to go to to know a little bit more. So I struck up conversation with him, and um, he's a sixty. He's in the sixties. He's a uh, he's he's lived in the. In, in Queens for the past uh, four years. He decided to move here because he just couldn't uh, support his his wife and his two kids anymore. So he basically uh, tries to find work and he usually doesn't find work because he's in his 60s and he's, people usually hire people in their 30s for the type of work that uh, he does. So he barely makes a living. Uh, at the end of the month, he he has no money to send back to his family, uh, but he's been doing it for four years and he's still doing it. And uh, you got to, you know, like admire people like that, that, you know, keep struggling and uh, keep sub subsisting on the bare minimals. And uh, I took this picture of him without him knowing that I was taking this picture. But uh, I showed it to him later, and he liked it. Um, and there's a more personal um, image, which is this image that I took of a lady that I've known for 25 years. Uh, her name is Maria Velez, and that she's the one on the left, and that's her sister who came to visit from North Carolina, uh, Maria Romana. Um, they're both from Guatemala. Um, they, between them, they have 10 children. And uh, when, they're, when their husbands left them for one reason or, or another, um, they, uh, they couldn't subsist uh, on, by themselves in Guatemala. So they both decided to move to the United States. Um, and uh, Maria cleans houses for a living. She cleans houses in Queens and Brooklyn. She's been doing that for the longest time. And Romana removes asbestos in an asbestos abating company in, in North Carolina. So um, they they came to see each other, and I took this picture uh, when they were visiting each other. Um, they haven't seen their, their children in the longest time, but they, they're here supporting them. And the kids are economically doing very well, emotionally not so well because they're missing their their mothers, but if uh, if you want to look at sacrifice, um, 
up to this day, uh, they have missed, between them, they have missed eight weddings, uh, the birth of 12 grandchildren. Uh, they've missed 10 high school graduations and uh, two college graduations. And they, they've witnessed it, witnessed it from, from afar. And uh, if you talk to them, they're very grateful for the opportunity this country has, has given them as far as being able to make, give their kids a, a future, even though they don't physically participate in it. Um, um, this, this shows uh, the sacrifice that so many people make. And it's not just here in the United States, it's, it's, it's everywhere else. So I continue to listen to stories that I've been, that I've been collecting. I, I keep uh, creating images to go with those stories. I think, I think the stories are super important and I see the images uh, are as secondary to the stories themselves um, and are there to support these stories that, uh, that I'm putting together. And um, I think that's, uh, that's about it as far as the, the series is concerned. Great, thank these, are the, you. these are the images that, uh, that are up at the museum at the moment. Great. Thank you, Orestes. Um, such powerful images. Um, and I think, you know, they're they're beautiful, um, but I think the stories within them also sort of, you know, pull you in different directions at the same time, um, which of course creates to the power of the image and the story together. Um, I do want to say hello to our audience members um, who are virtual with us. I want to give a shout out to Professor Stephen Harris, who's actually with his class in Clapper Hall listening to these con this conversation. So hello to everyone and all the students, of course, at Queens College um, this evening. Hello to Lori, um, Rachel, Men, um, William Rivera joining us from Miami. So this is such a wonderful reach that, you know, um, we can do with uh, some of this virtual programming. Um, Natalia, uh, Tasnia. So I want to get to a couple of um, uh, questions um, that we're getting. And I, I, I encourage everyone that's listening um, to our conversation to, to submit your questions for Orestes um, in the chat. And I'm happy to share that with him. Um, Orestes, as we go through these 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 photographs, you know, I can't we can't help but wonder how did you how do you approach these individuals to capture these moments to take a photo of them? Um, you know, I think not everyone you know can just take a photo of just any person, and you know, and I, I think that's such a personal uh, personal space. But yeah. how, how do you do it to yeah. ensure that? Um, they feel comfortable. Yeah, it, that's a very good question. I, I try to develop a relationship with them. Uh, in, in situations where you are in a foreign country and they see you as a tourist, um, sometimes it works to your benefit to, to be kind of like direct and you take a picture and you move on. Uh, but sometimes, by just doing that, you don't get the essence of the person and you don't find out anything about them. So what I try to do is is uh, establish a connection with them and make sure that uh, they feel comfortable enough for, for, the, for them to talk about themselves. For example, the, um, the, uh, the picture I took of... Uh, of uh, Mario in Buenos Aires, he was he was in a he was in a tourist area. He uh, he's used to people like con uh, approaching him in a very superficial way and then disappearing, never seeing them again. So uh, I felt confident that I was able to uh, talk to him without him feeling threatened or intimidated. And when I noticed that his accent was different than the Porteño accent that uh, I'm used to listening to. Uh, he uh, told me he was from Paraguay and that uh, he told me his story of of him coming here 
um, as an orphan and working in the streets of uh, Buenos Aires for such a long time. Um, in this situation, um, the uh, the the story superseded the the image. Um, the the story of these two girls who weren't able to uh, compete in in the way that they deserve to compete because of the political uh, climate at the moment uh, really struck with me. And so I kept thinking, how how do I express this in in a photograph? Um, and lo and behold, there was a the the beginning of a, a, a of snow coming through through the park in in my neighborhood in Long Island City. And I had my I was actually lucky enough to have my my big Nikon camera with me, and I started taking pictures of these two girls uh, enjoying the first uh, signs of snow of the snowflakes that were coming down at that moment. Uh, and I thought, wow, this is these two these two are just perfect for the story that I've been trying to like find a way to to illustrate and I came upon this you know um, uh, this person I, I I knew through a friend of mine and I knew the story for years and uh, she was kind enough to let me follow her around and um, I did a a bunch of photographs, but this is the one that really touched me and the one that I used. Uh, so they, m most of the time, I uh, I establish a rapport a rapport with them, uh, and uh, get them to feel comfortable enough for me to to be able to take photographs that are not as literal as they have to be, but a little bit more symbolic in in a way, a little bit more spiritual. Right. Wonderful. I think along those lines, um, you mentioned your photo, your your camera that you use. What cameras do you usually use? Um, do you carry, you know, one particular camera when you're sort of um, yeah, going I, out? I um, you know, you want you, you try to be as unobtrusive as possible. Um, but I've been carrying around Nikon cameras since the eighties and. Uh, I, I learned photography and I learned my love of photography um, by carrying this big clunky camera around. Um, sometimes it inti intimidates people. But then the iPhone came into the scene. Voila, you know, it's like mm. <laughs> um, I tried to resist it for, for the longest time. Um, but as years went by, the, they started getting better and better and better. And all of a sudden, I see myself with a really good uh, iPhone in my pocket, and uh, which is not the case with my clunky uh, Nikon equipment. Um, it it's always there. It's always in my pocket. It's always available for me to pull out of my pocket. And if I see a situation that uh, worth is merits a, a picture, I take a picture. So, um, yeah, I've gotten to the point where the iPhone is actually more important to me right now as a photographer, uh, and my intent has become stronger because of, of the fact that it's always with me. Um, and I'm using my big, heavier equipment for uh, portrait photography, things that I set up that I create and an environment and I use my bigger camera for that. So I'm, I'm, I'm basically using both equipment, but leaning towards the iPhone to get really more interesting ph photography. Yeah, that's so interesting. Also yeah. something we, you know, I've, I've come across um, in other conversations about photography and something that's actually very big, especially with you know, everyone more or less um, having access to a, a phone with a camera is the use of filters and editing. Um, can you talk a little bit about your, you know, do you edit your photos? How do you edit them? What kind of, you know, what's the process like? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The editing is very important. Um, I, um, I, I work a lot uh, in Lightroom, uh, especially with the images I, I take with my Nikon. 
um, and the editing process uh, is very important. Uh, not to transform the the photographs to to something that they're not supposed to be, but just to to sharpen them, to make them more palatable, to make them uh, communicate more with the people that are going to be seeing it. Um, the beauty of the iPhone is it's got its own incredible editing tools that that I use, um, and uh, I try not to use filters. Uh, um, as much as as other people tend to use them, I, I feel that sometimes they're a little bit too extreme. But I definitely use the editing tools in in the iPhone cameras that that are available now that that are really incredible. Another feature that the iPhone has is that we you can shoot in RAW, which means that you can enlarge these images to poster size and even bigger if uh, the light is right and the uh, the size is correct for that. Great. I do have a question I see from um, Professor Stephen Harris's studio lighting class, and it's a two-part question. So I'm going to start with the first part. Okay. Um, they would like to know how many languages were you able to speak on your travels? And then the second part is, um, were you also concerned about photographing people who may not have had legal status? Um. I speak fluent Spanish and I speak rudimentary English. So um, I get along pretty well with uh, with most people. Um, and in my travels, English is super important. I think most people speak English and in areas that are urban and, and I find I find myself communicating with, with them pretty well. And of course, Spanish. Spanish is everywhere in the United States. It's in, every country that I go to in Central and South America, uh, you'll find people speaking Spanish. Um, you know, um, it's not it's not a problem. Um, and what were you saying about about uh, the lighting? Did you um, say oh, this is from a stu the studio lighting class. So they were asking um, if, you know, how many languages you were able to speak on your travels, but also were you concerned um, about photographing people who may not have had legal status? Mm. Um, let's see. Um, the, uh, the people that I have have photographed that uh, don't have legal status, I, I, uh, I change their names, you know. I, uh, I protect them that way. I don't, I don't say exactly where they're living or, or, or where they where they're coming from. So I keep it as broad based as, as, as possible to protect them. Um, I do know that um, in this limited series that I've done, um, some of the people that I've photographed that were, that were undocumented are now documented and fully part of our system here. So it lessens the, uh, the problems that, that can come with, people that have illegal or undocumented status here. Wow. How did you know that um, their status has changed? Where, did you keep in contact with them? Those are um, people that I continue having a relationship oh. with and that, you know, we celebrate their getting their green card. Great. Yeah. And I think right along those lines, we have a question from Ray Balthazar um, who says, "It's great. this is great, meaningful work. Uh, do you think you'll turn this into a book? Yeah, yeah, I think I think it would be a, a wonderful book. I'd I'd like to incorporate more uh, imagery. Um, maybe turn it into twenty images with twenty stories, uh, twenty chapters. So um, I I I definitely would be interested in that, and uh, always looking for a collaborator to to write the the text on it. Oh, great. Um, let me look through some more of the questions and chat um, comments. Uh, you are getting lots of wonderful comments um, right. in our uh, comment section here. Um, Naomi loved the colors in some of the photographs that you were showing. Um, I do have a question from 
Uh, Pandora1302 who asks, um, this series is extremely meaningful. Are you going to continue working in this scene or have you moved on to other pursuits? So I guess you kind of answered that. You get you kind of gave us a little hint, yeah. um, but I'm sure yeah. there's there's more. Yeah, I'm I'm very ex I'm actually very excited about this this series because of the tumult in the world, the uh, things that are happening. Um, there are other subjects that uh, I would like to grasp and elaborate on. Um, I love traveling. I love going to different parts of the world. Uh, so I would like to be able to capture more stories and mm -hmm. interpret them not only through the uh, the stories that that are given to me by these people, but in the imagery that I can create to illustrate these stories. So I'm I'm definitely going to continue working on this. Great, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, I do have another question. Uh, the lighting you use is mostly natural light, which we can see. But one question is, do you use any flash attachments or speed lights when you shoot? No, no. <laughs> I do not like to use uh, flash attachments. Uh, it, unfortunately for me, um, I find that it, it uh, disrupts the, the mood. Um, and and I I don't use it. I do use all sorts of tricks. I I have people stand inside a room facing the window. Uh, I I like people to to stand uh, under a street lamp, and I and I use a reflector. Um, I use as little lighting equipment as possible. Not that it's bad. Uh, I have to admit that I'm not. I'm not techno prone like like other people are, and I respect them for that. But I I like to work light and uh, fast and simple. So the the biggest thing that I will carry with me is one of these uh, expandable reflectors that that I use. Wow, great! Yeah, <laughs> um, and sometimes now at night, it's really interesting because uh, with the new. Uh, equipment that's out there that is taking incredible nighttime photography. Mm -hmm. uh, those reflectors are great and you get amazing effects. Uh, so I'm going to continue working in, in this vein and it, it works for me. Great. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, I think for any aspiring photographers, um, artists that are currently, you know, that are listening to our conversation today, yeah. can you talk a little bit about any sort of, any challenges that you faced um, when, you know, trying to create this sort of type of, of, of photographic series um, or any anything that, you know, you, you thought that it was such a, you know, maybe what continued to inspire you to, to continue to create this? Um, I would, we'd love to know that. Um, what, what inspires me is the fact that, uh, I'm bringing, I'm bringing to light small scale sacrifices uh, or stories, I should say, more than sacrifices, uh, small scale stories that normally do not get talked about. Um, human stories that are about sacrifice and due diligence and and uh, perseverance. Uh, those, you know, because. All the all the problems that we have in the world are so huge and and devastating that I think uh, there's always a place in the world for the small stories, the human human stories that inspire us and make us make us feel good about the situation that we're in uh, and appreciate the good stuff that we have. Uh, compared to other people that maybe don't have the same fortune that that we have, so uh, I, I I'd like to continue working that way and uh, discovering more opportunities to to bring these small stories to to the fore. Yeah, that's great. Um, I do. Let me see. Let me look through some of these. I do encourage you to continue um, sharing any comments or questions you may have for Orestes in the comment section. Um, can you tell us a little bit, you know, 
we've we've seen sort of these amazing photographs um, that are currently part of our migrations exhibition. Um, I would love to know, like, tell us what what else do you have that's coming up um, that you can share with us that you can learn a little bit more about you. Sure. Um, um, I'm actually in in the final stages of putting a uh, my a, another book together. It's uh, going to be called Habanero. Habanero means uh, somebody from Havana. Um, I have spent, uh, I've been to back to Cuba three times. Um, once as a student at, from the University of Texas, I went back and I worked on a construction kibbutz back in the in the 80s. And uh, then I did go back for 40, 40 years, and um, I went back in 2016 to to revisit family members that that stayed. Um, and I was very I I was very touched with the way I perceived things to be in Cuba versus what I saw, mm -hmm. which was very different. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and so I went back in 2016, and then I went back in January of 2020 for a show that uh, was very, uh, I was very honored to receive a, a, a show at the uh, Fabrica de Arte Cubano mm -hmm. in, in Havana um, regarding a book that came out in 2018 called Julio's House. And uh, we had a, a, a wonderful exhibit that we put together we we printed the the pieces there i worked with the printer i worked with the the guy that made the frames uh it was a, a wonderful experience uh we put the, the work together and as we were creating the show i kept taking photographs i kept taking photographs with my iphone um cuba cuba is like a photographer's paradise uh and uh it's it, it's a situation that is that is so easy to take photographs in. Um, but my photographs were a little different in the sense that I was taking photographs as a Cuban American going back and experiencing uh, things that I thought were different. So this book called Habanero is uh, basically um, a series of images that I've t taken in these two trips uh, and that show my my view of what I expected to find mm -hmm. and what I found, you know, I found, I found some very inspirational things. And of course you find other realities that don't make sense anywhere else in the world. So um, I was trying to break away with a photo trope of uh, photo books from Cuba. So there's no, there's very, very few photographs of old cars or buildings that are falling apart. It's it's mostly a, a symbolic book. It's something very different that I think uh, people will be touched and and uh, get a lot of, a lot of, out of it. And I made a conscious decision that all the photographs are going to be black and white. Wow. Which a lot of people say, "Are you crazy? You're not. You're gonna do. You're not gonna do Q and color." I said, "No, absolutely not. This is about symbolism, um, and uh, it's it's not uh, the Cuban trope that mm -hmm. uh, you expect." So that'll that's gonna be coming out early early next year. Okay. And um, I don't know if if you if you know, I'm director of uh, photographic projects at Culture Lab uh, in Long Island City. Um, we put together three, four different uh, photo shows a, a year, and uh, we just put one up, a uh, call to artists called the Alternative Process Camera, uh, New Ways of Seeing. It's, uh, the, it's an open call that will be av available for artists to participate in until uh, the deadline, I think, is uh, November 17th. So that's, that's coming up. Uh, you can go to Cultural Lab lic.com.org and uh, look up that artist opportunity there. I think it's it's really uh, it's going to be a really interesting show. We're getting we're getting uh, work from Indonesia, uh, from China, um, 
from South America. I'm, I'm very excited with the amount of work that we're going to get. And some of the work that me, we may not physically be able to show in the, uh, in the space because mm -hmm. it's coming from other countries, we will, we're going to set up a, a virtual show of these other images that are coming from all over the world. Wow. Yeah. So you're, you're, a bit, you're a busy guy, Orestes. Yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, to top it off, uh, I'm going to be in my first art fair ever. I've, I've never done an art fair, and I'm going to be very proudly participating with 16 other artists wow. through the SHIM Art Network. And we're going uh, to have a booth at the Mana Contemporary Art, uh, art, uh, art Fair in Jersey City. Uh, this coming weekend from from Thursday through Sunday night. So hopefully I can meet some of some of the people that have participated as the audience members members today and see them at the art fair. Absolutely. And we will share all this information at the end. So if anyone is interested in anything um, and everything that Orestes is doing, um, you can definitely check that out um, after our program. Um, we do have another question coming up um, from Ray Balthazar. Did you ever think of doing a short documentary film, uh, like a step up from photography to express your artistic endeavor? Um, because as we all know, the iPhones can make videos too. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's going to be maybe another another step in in a direction that I've always wanted to take. Mm. But but it takes a little bit more effort in the sense that videos are, are something that I'm not really adept at doing, but uh, it's, I'm certainly open to that. And uh, I'd like to participate with other people that are more uh, experienced in that. So we could, we could do some sort of collaboration. Um, yeah. There's also, there's also another, I did actually, I did a, I did a beautiful little uh, eight-minute video uh, two years ago with the original founders of the Gay Liberation Front. Um, I was honored to be able to participate in taking their portraits. Uh, these are people that fought for gay liberation in 1971, right after the Stonewall riots. Wow. And uh, uh, they were celebrating their... 50, 50 year uh, anniversary. So I was able to photograph all these like wonderful people that uh, fought so hard for the rights of, of gays and yeah. lesbians. And I put together a, um, a short video. Um, if you go to Orestes Gonzalez on Vimeo, you could you could see it. It's it's beautiful and and I had the the music was composed by by Pat Irwin, who was one of the members of the B-52s. Um, and uh, it's out there in Vimeo if you want to take a look. Wow, that's amazing. That's really great, Orestes. Um, I think, let me look through some of the, more of the comments here. Um, I think Professor Stephen Harris's class really had several favorites of the of your photographs. Um, I think they include the first image with the man in the plastic beach toys. The, um, of course, the 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 men at Home Depot, um, which is again, I think, a very very powerful image. Um, you know, um, because I I know I certainly I grew up in Queens and I've certainly seen them. Um, and you know, it's one of those things when you when I looked at the at your photographs the first time, it's one of those things where there's the picture, the photograph, but there's so much more, you know. With, with and then just, just to read the stories behind that, um, sort of make it all come together. And you know, it's like you said, it's sort of the reality of what people, um, you know, on the day to day go through, um, yeah. which is very important to keep in mind um, because. Oftentimes we're all very focused on, you know, sort of on our own lane, not thinking about, you know, what everyone else can be feeling or thinking about. But, you know, the reality is that sort of we're all in it together, but we're also each Absolutely. going through our own sort of set of challenges and circumstances. And I think, you know, the the variety of the photos um, in your in this disruption series really attest to that and to think about 
um, the challenges people face. Uh, but then, as you also mentioned, you know, to celebrate those moments of, you know, the milestones that, you know, of, of people maybe uh, getting their green cards, um, you know, and sort of it goes back and forth. So, you know, that is it's it's just so wonderful to see that. Um, Thank you. Present. I do encourage everyone uh, check out Orestes um, photographs um, in our show um, of um, migrations. But I think, you know, there's just so many wonderful comments um, in our um, in our section here. Um, thank you, you know, for this great lecture, they're saying um, Orestes wonderful work. Um, but yeah, I think if there are no other questions, um, you know, I'm gonna just say thank you so much, Orestes, um, thank for you. being with us this evening and for sharing your work. Thank um, you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I want to thank you, uh, and, uh, everybody at the, at the museum that, uh, put this wonderful show together. So, uh, yes. Louise Weinberg. And Louise. Yes, and uh, everybody else that's involved in that wonderful museum, which is a jewel that we have here in Queens that we should all be very, very proud of. Thank you so much, Orestes. Um, I know Louise uh, Weinberg is the curator, uh, co-director with me at the Godwin Turnbeck Museum. Um, and I know we are both very grateful for, uh, for you, for contributing your photographs to this exhibition, for being here this evening with us. Um, so thank you. And of course, thank you to all of you for joining us um, this evening uh, via this live stream. Um, if you do want to keep up with Orestes' work, like we mentioned, please check out his Instagram at Orestes Gonzalez Photo. And uh, of course, his website at OrestesGonzalez.com. Don't forget to check out gtmuseum.org to view our virtual exhibitions and upcoming program information. And of course, kufferbergcenter.org for a complete listing of upcoming programs through Kufferberg Center for the Arts. Uh, well, that concludes our show this evening. Orestes, again, thank you so much. Mil gracias. Thank you all uh, for being with us this evening and have a great night. Thank you, guys. Thank you for participating and, and uh, getting me to talk about my photographs, which uh, I, I barely, rarely do. And I'm very touched that you were able to follow me in this uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night.